Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Business, Finance, and Justice Committee meeting. Today is Thursday, May the 11th, 2023. I call this meeting to order at 3 o'clock p.m. Invocation, Representative Pat Freeman, please. Thank you, Representative Freeman. Roll call, Legislative Clerk, April Lindsay. Patrick Freeman. Yes. Sandra Golden. Present. Randall Hicks. Present. Thomasine Yehola Osborne. Present. Mark Randolph. Present. Madam Chair, you got five present and zero absent. We have five present and zero absent. This constitute a quorum. All business conducted will be valid. Next item on the agenda is approval of minutes of April the 20th, 2023. When the committee is ready, I'll entertain a motion. Madam Chair, make a motion to approve the minutes with any changes as necessary. We have a motion to approve the minutes from Representative we'll see, huh? Hicks. Do I have a second? A second from Representative Golden. Discussion? Any discussion? Hearing none, roll call vote, please. Randall Hicks? Yes. Mark Randolph? Yes. Patrick Freeman? Yes. Sandra Golden? Yes. Madam Chair, you got four in favor and zero against. We have four in favor and zero against. The minutes of April 20th, 2023 are approved. Stop here. <clears throat> Next item on the agenda is order of business. NCA 23 036, a law of the Muscogee Creek Nation amending MCNCA Title 14, Subchapter 3, Subsection 1 309, entitled Extradition of Defendant Subject to Other Jurisdiction. Sponsor, Representative Randall Hicks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I make a motion to postpone until next month's BFJ meeting. We have a motion from Representative Hicks to postpone until next BFJ meeting. Second. We have a second from Representative Randolph. Any discussion? Madam Chair, I'd like to allow uh, A.G. Dellinger some time to kind of explain why the postponement. Mr. Dellinger. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you, uh, committee. I just wanted to, if I could be brief, give you a little bit of an idea of why we're Requesting this legislation. Uh, the nation's code has a uh, provision for extradition, but it's reserved, so there's nothing there right now. So uh, at uh, the previous uh, intertribal uh, council meeting, the judicial uh, committee met and the uh, issue of extradition came up. And um, there's uh, one of the things we're going to be considering at the next intertribal meeting uh, will be the uh, a potential agreement between the five tribes to allow for extradition between the tribes. Okay, so I think all the tribes are in favor of that and in favor of working towards it. But uh, the first thing that went off of my mind was, well, we don't have a statute. It's premature to agree to extradition when we don't have an extradition statute in our code yet. So that's why we're bringing this forth from the from the um, court. We're bringing it forth, but we've also asked for input from um, the. Um, AG's office and uh, also from um, uh, the chief's office uh, issued some uh, ish, uh, comments on it today um, and also um, I've spoken with your legal counsel for uh, the National Council and so there are a couple little tweaks I think that uh, might need to be made to it but I think we're in pretty much agreement that we, we need this um, and so we're just trying to be a little proactive and get this done before the next in our tribal uh, council meeting. So um, I understand it's going to be postponed today, but I just kind of wanted to give you a little bit of history of why we're trying to do this and why we think it's important. Um, one, because we don't have it on the books. Two, I think we need it. So if there is someone that is in another jurisdiction that uh, we need to extradite back to the tribe to prosecute, we can, or to cooperate with the other tribes if we have somebody that they have a, uh, a warrant out on or that they need to uh, prosecute, that we could work with them to them to do that. So that's kind of where this is coming from. 
And I didn't know if I, I know uh, Mr. Williams had some comments from um, from the executive branch, and I think most of those can be answered. But uh, he he brings up some good points too, and um, I don't know that uh, I can answer those for with respect to the AG's office. But you know, one issue is like, where does this start? Does it start with the AG's office? Is a request made with them? Or is a request made with Light Horse? Uh, where does the process start? So I think we need to, to me, that should start probably in the AG's office or in Light Horse, one of the two, but I didn't feel comfortable obligating that to them without them having the ability to um, determine amongst themselves where they thought that would best fit. I don't think it starts at the court because we don't issue and we don't file cases. So I don't think it starts at the court. So just some things like that. I think uh, Mr. Williams brought up another point too that uh, this doesn't represent, uh, d does not reference the reservation, but refers to us as the Muscogee Creek Nation. And so I think we can put the uh, Muscogee Creek Nation reservation in the in the law, so that's easily fixable. Um, so if you don't mind, I can go over these issues real quick. I, I think we will uh, have time to get this done. Our goal is to try to get it done before the ITC meeting in July. So I think if this can be considered at a minimum in June, uh, we should be able to meet that date. But uh, um, another issue was um, the law provides for a person that we have in our custody uh, to, um, to fight the issue of extradition and that they're entitled to legal counsel. So, so one of the issues was, well, where who pays for that and where does that come from? And we already have a contract that we currently allow uh, court-appointed counsel for those who don't have it. And so we will just utilize that program, and that will be paid out of the court's budget. So that issue uh, is answerable and taken care of. Um, I think there's also an issue about non-Indians and whether we have jurisdiction over them and, and can hold them. You know, obviously under VAWA we can, in other situations we may not be able to, but I think that decision, that's why you go through the process and a, a person can challenge extradition and then a judge would make the decision on whether uh, we can hold somebody and extradite them or whether there's not jurisdiction to do, show, do so and they need to be released. So. There's, there's that issue that I think can be, that is easily ad addressable. And then I think one other is the issue of who pays for the detention. And if we are detaining somebody for another jurisdiction, they pay us for that cost that we've held them. We can hold them up to 15 days. Um, if they don't show up in 15 days, they're released. If they make a request for us to hold them an additional amount of time, we can, under the law, we can hold them up to 45 days, but again, if we're detaining them on behalf of another jurisdiction under the law, they have to reimburse us for the cost of us holding them in detention. So, so I think those kind of issues are, are fairly easy to, uh, to answer. But uh, again, there's those couple that uh, deal with, uh, you know, I think Light Horse, they have not responded. Uh, and so I don't know if they're comfortable of starting the process with them or, again, if the AG's office is. But I think those issues are easily uh, negotiable. We can discuss them and we can put those in, into the legislation to uh, uh, make sure everybody understands that. I think ultimately what we all want um, is a law that everybody understands and knows the answers to the questions and they're, they're there. So... Uh, I, I drafted this, but I, I'll be the first to say, you know, it, uh, if there's some other eyes looking at it and there's some things that, that need to be filled in, we can do that. And I think that's what we ultimately want is a, a really well-written law that everybody can understand and, and that is easily enforceable. So. Representative Hicks, anything else? Thank you, Mr. Dillinger. I'm sorry, my microphone wasn't on. <laughs> Okay, we have a motion on the floor to postpone this for until the next BF&J meeting. We have a second from Representative Randolph. Roll call vote, please. Randall Hicks. Yes. Mark Randolph. Yes. Patrick Freeman. Yes. Sandra Golden. Yes. Madam Chair, you have four in favor and zero against. We have four in favor, zero against. NCA 23-036 is postponed until the next BF&J meeting. NCA 23-037, a law of the Muscogee Creek Nation creating new law in Title 37, Chapter 10, entitled Department, Departmental Policies and Procedures. Sponsor, Representative Sandra Golden. Motion for a due pass. We have a motion for due pass from Representative Golden. 
A second from Representative, Representative Freeman. Discussion? Representative Golden? <clears throat> yes. Um, this came about, I guess, um, pretty much from a number of different calls that we've been receiving, talking with other representatives. And we, we really don't know what the internal infrastructure is as far as how the policies relate and when it comes to providing the services to the citizens. And so when we have to um, explain to them why it's done this way, we really don't know what the policies are. And, and we don't really have a way of, of knowing that. Um, we have to have policies uh, within the um, organization, like for personnel, fiscal policies, property and supply. But uh, I'm, I, we have all those, I'm sure. We just don't know what they are. But it's, it's, it's more intense when it happens with our citizens who don't know when these things change, and we, we don't know. And some of the programs are tribally funded, some of the programs are grant funded, and sometimes those policies and procedures don't match. And so this is just a way to, uh, I say, have our infrastructure working better, especially, uh, I don't wanna call anybody's name out, but uh, maybe it was last month when we had um, somebody in housing and um, there was a letter written to somebody relate, related to a policy that we didn't know that existed. And so the uh, housing person had to go and look back and say, oh, that was a mistake, but none of us knew that it was there or not. And so I think this just helps us to, to be able to work together better and for the provision of services to the citizens across the board. Thank you, Representative Golden. Is there any other discussion? Representative Randall? I'd like to give someone from the executive branch uh, for whoever would like to speak. <clears throat> Thank you, Representative Randall. Um, you know, I, I get several emails, calls uh, on issues, as you had mentioned. I felt like we've, uh, I've received some from Representative Hicks, Representative Randolph, and Representative Osborne, Chairman Osborne, and I think we've always addressed those. And this is the first time I've heard of this. Um, I know you sent me some emails concerning housing or different issues that come up, but this is the first time I've heard of it. And it's really under the executive branch to make sure these are corrected. Um, what, what kind of examples do you have uh, <clears throat> well, it, it, it's it's like uh, when we uh, when we have the budgets, for example, and we put in the legislation that certain things will happen. Well, once it's implemented, sometimes uh, the, the the policies don't match what we put in there, and then uh, then you well, guys you got you got examples. I mean, you got certain items or which ones? Well, we put the money in for for the budget to to do certain things. And I'm not just trying to pull out one or the other, but when it's implemented, once they there's some policies and procedure guidelines that they go by, okay. Sometimes um, I want to say burial assistance at one time. When they changed what they were going to do as far as the monies from four thousand to three thousand, and they said that it would not affect. Everybody said this won't affect the people from the out of bounds. And one of the things was, you have to go to Bureau of Indian Affairs first before you come back to us. And so if they were out of bounds, they didn't know where the nearest BIA was. And so they didn't, they didn't, they were running around like, how are we gonna get our loved one buried if we don't know where the BIA is to, to submit our application for it to be approved or disapproved? Things like that, I think it's, you know, the applications is there for BIA, is that, am I correct? So they, they get the application there at the office. They fill right. that out first, and they, once they get the denial, then they apply for that. And that's what I'm saying. 
when the policies and the pr procedure, which comes first and where do they go? They don't have, there's a gap in the information. So if we know that and it's already there when we pass the legislation, we can pass that on to the, to the citizens and it doesn't have to come to you. It, does, it goes from them to where they're supposed to go because we know what the policy is and we know what the procedure is. And that's what this is. It's not trying to tell anybody to do to do your job or don't do your job. It's just trying to get things to, to match mm -hmm. and keep the gaps. That's, that's what I'm saying. If I know ahead of time, I'll get with the cabinet, we'll get with the managers, and they get that corrected. So I know there's issues as far as uh, uh, employees, how they're rude when they answer the phone. Make sure I address it to the cabinet members. They address it to their managers, directors, so I get that corrected. I mean, if I know ahead of time that we're having these problems, we can get it corrected, but I don't see why this is necessary. Well, it, it's, it's like you're saying, if you know ahead of time, there, there may be somebody in that office that, that's no longer there and there's another person there. They don't have any guidelines to go by. So if we make sure that that's there, then they know what to do, even if you're there or if you're not. Well, that's when it's brought to my attention. They make sure the cabinet and the managers make sure that their base workers, whoever it may be, are aware of it, try to get it corrected. Uh, there was another incident also. But these are things I need to know. Yeah, I understand that. Uh, for example, uh, there was a time when everybody was off early on a Friday and someone lost their loved one that day. And then there was a holiday and that person, it was, the, it was on a Monday and the next day their, per, their loved one was gonna be buried. And they weren't able to get a hold to anybody over the weekend, the emergency calls, everything. And so it was on a Monday, uh, this person was still trying to get a hold to somebody because they, the wake service was that night and they hadn't, they hadn't even turned in their application because they couldn't get a hold to anybody. We do come up with situations like that, but I assure you, Aaron Salsman works the weekends and that's who uh, I I'm, normally address it to. I'm, I'm understanding again, all of that. If you're but, aware of it, I need to know because well, we can we can because we need to service the citizens, and we always make sure that they are taken care of, especially in a funeral service like that. Well, you asked me to give you some examples, mm -hmm. and so like I said, I did work with our attorney on how we could do these things better together, not to try to make anybody do something differently. Um, it's just to make sure that all those things are in place. We have the policies and the procedures. There's some of these programs that they've got a new person in there and they, they, they haven't even been able to find them. And so when it gets to you, finally, then you may have to go all down the line and we have to go all down the line. This just helps us work together better. To make we're sure all, that if we're all about working together, how come me and my office weren't where it is? Did you reach out to anybody in the executive office about this legislation? Um, yes or no? I said that what I did was co combine everything that I had been working on with all the different citizens. And this is something that I had talked to the attorney about. And I thought that it was, uh, um, I can't go uh, and talk to anybody else unless I talk to you. And then um, I can't talk to the programs. Have I gave you and an I have, to talk and to I have, I have asked for policies and procedures, and I still haven't received them. Um, did you go through the process? Did, did you go through a speaker? Because I see three of them on here that has contacted the speaker or emailed me personally, and I and I have given y'all you all permission to talk to the directors. So, does all of your programs have policies and procedures, and you review them? Somebody reviews them. They do. That's what their job is. And when was the last, what's the review process? I think whenever they get updated. I don't know, Carmen, can you explain that? How often do y'all update them? Any? Ms. Carmen, Ms. Carmen, if you'll come to, that way everybody can hear on the, on the Zoom. Thank you. I apologize. Thank you. Um, Yes, any time that we do have policies and procedures uh, that need to be updated, maybe due to legislation, maybe due to changes in uh, other works that are going on within uh, our federal statutes, within um, 
just at any given time that those that we have to have changes to our policies and procedures, those get updated. Those are sent to uh, the chief's office for him to, to know that those policies and procedures were updated and his approval is given. So uh, anytime that, that policies and procedures, uh, if we do a reorg, a reorganization of, of any of the departments or programs, uh, if policy and procedures change, then those, th then those issues go through, our, through, the, through the executive office for their approval. <clears throat> so the um, I also have a different set of eyes. Once I get it, I give it to second chief, chief of staff, and child administrator. Because if it coincides with HR, you have to make sure it's implemented the same. So you know, the uh, policy that uh, just passed on the um, energy assistance program that everybody has to go through the um, portal. Who reviewed that and approved it? Aaron, Aaron Salzman and their team, Carmen, everyone that's in that department, the cabinet, the deputy, and Aaron and I think Denise was involved to review the policies and they bring it to us. Zexer Branch, me, second chief, chief of staff and travel administrator, we review it just in case one of us missed anything. Okay, in okay. So, so just one more thing and I'm just going to just let it go. <clears throat> but when that policy got put in place, the citizens didn't know about it, and, and the council members that I know of, I didn't know about it. And so when the citizens are calling and saying, who changed this and why, and, and they're scrambling around trying to find out where do they go and what do they do to apply for their energy assistance, because the last time they applied, it was a different process. And so it seems like it's been from the top down instead of saying, here, citizens, how can we serve you better? And is this the best way? And they feel like they, it doesn't happen. So the policy comes from the top based on what we want to do, not, not necessarily what the citizens need. Thank you, Representative Golden. Second Chief. Um. I'm going to counsel for uh, allow me a couple minutes. Um, this really isn't about policies um, because we do have policy. We have shared policy. Um, I've sitting here and listened to um, policy that's not true. Um, we went out to the communities a whole month before we implemented the, uh, the portal, going through the portal. And it's not that you have to go through the portal. We've said this t entire time that we recommend you go through the portal. We still have paper copies. You can ask anybody on our cabinet. We said, make sure you have paper copies in case somebody wants to do a paper copy application. So those are still available. Nobody ever said you have to go through the portal system. Okay, And so that's just one thing. Um, and also, some of these policies are mandated by federal government. Okay, If we accept federal funds, we got to accept federal law and federal policies. Okay, um, But what this is really about is that um, in this legislation, uh, I have a, there's a, a few concerning bullet points on here that um, that's really just not true. Um, the National Council is not responsible for um, uh, providing, ensuring quality of services. That's not the National Council responsibility. That's the the duly uh, serve, That's the duly responsibility of the elective of the uh, executive branch. And I think we can all agree on that. The National Council is not about providing services. You're about what the law says, providing the money so we can provide services. And that's what the law says, and that's what, that's what our Supreme Court has said. And so there's a couple of other things in here that uh, I think overreaches what the National Council is supposed to do. And so, um, so it's very concerning not only to us, but to all the employees of the nation. And so uh, we've had a lot of feedback um, about this law from our employees, and it's not good feedback. And so if we want to have a sit down and talk about policies, then we can. But this has never came to our desk. We never heard about this before, um, before we saw it come through. And so if we're going to talk about policies, then, uh, um, you know, hey, uh, I, I think that we should have a sit down and talk. I think that would be the uh, correct way to do these things is come down and sit where we are and we can talk about policies. But this legislation right now, I think, is illegal. I think it oversteps boundaries. And, uh, and that's what I have to say about it. So. Thank you, Second Chief. Are there any questions, Representative Hicks? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Kyle, I've got a question for you, sir. Well, basically, 
is this or is this not a executive function for the policies and procedures? I think it's National Council's responsibility to oversee the funds of the nation. So in that regard, making sure that your funds are expended appropriately to ensure that all the goods and services that are provided as they should be, I think that does fall back to the council. The council is responsible, responsible for the treasury of the nation. But it's the executive branch's responsibility for policies and procedures. I, I cannot disagree with you. Okay. Now, my next question is actually on the last page. I don't know if you have it. Yes, sir. Number two, failure to comply with this law will impact such department's annual appropriations. How is that? Again, it's back up to the National Council to approve the budget on an annual basis to fund the different departments. So you need compliance to ensure that they are doing what you're funding them to do. I think a lot of what's happening is there's not a complete understanding that there are policies and procedures because the calls do come to the National Council about what policies and procedures apply. And it's just that those cannot be forwarded on to the individual citizens. That's kind of what I understand the issue to be. So I think the assumption is they don't have policies and procedures that they can share with citizenry. Maybe I'm not seeing this right or maybe I'm not understanding my position. As a tribal legislator, my understanding is we write the laws. Yes, sir. Executive branch writes policies and procedures, and it's their responsibility to follow the, pro the policies and procedures. It's not my responsibility to make them. Well, I agree with that. I agree with that. I think the response, or the response I would have for you, based upon the questions that were asked or the directions I was given by Representative Golden there, how do the citizens know? So the question was, how do you, should you have a copy of the policies and procedures so you can present it to the citizens so the questions can be answered? Again, maybe I'm wrong, but when a citizen asks me a question about policies and procedures, I don't answer them directly. My response is, let me get with the executive branch to get the correct answer, so I'm not telling you anything different. So to me, that's my process. Again, my process or my way is legislative, that's an executive function. I want the correct answer, then I reach out to the executive branch and I do not try to answer a policy and procedure question. And I can't disagree with that process, Representative. I think the request, though, was to be able to present to the citizens a copy of the policies and procedures and wanting to ensure that policies and procedures exist so that they can be passed along to the citizens. Which, which I understand, but again, it goes back to my, the way I see it, it should go back to the executive branch they should be the ones to answer the question, not counsel. That's just, I certainly thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any other questions from the committee? Any questions from the representatives online or in attendance? Yes, uh, Madam Chair, this is Representative Hardy. Go ahead, sir. I, I was just sitting here listening to, you know, a lot of the discussion that was going on, uh, and I have to be a, in agreement too as well that you know, legislative branch, yes, we are about writing laws. And, you know, that's that's uh, what our branch is. But the executive side, they have their due diligence that they have to take care of. And that is to make sure that the uh, departments are ran properly and that they have their proper policies in place. But that's not our area. I think uh, when we look at this stuff that you're speaking in terms of, we're dealing with an issue that deals with day-to-day. -day. Uh, we don't deal with the day-to-day -day stuff. We deal with other issues. Uh, we may be advocates, and we may set the place to where we listen to the citizens. And again, I think it reflects right back to what uh, Representative Dixon said, that then we set forward and we ask the executive branch, and we ask them uh, to speak to that particular policy with this particular citizen. Or if they can relate to us, and, and then we can deal with it, however it needs to be done. But I know that, as for me, I don't know any of the policies. Uh, and it, does it, should it behoove me to know all the policies? I don't think so, because we've got enough of our own that we need to deal with. Uh, and this right here is on the executive side, as I don't believe it has anything to do with this. Uh, now, we may, we may uh, approve the budgets for the expenditures of the monies and different things, 
And, and I'm sure that if there's something in there to where they had to bring policies to be approved, but then, then I think at that time we're updated on what's happening. But outside of that, I, I think it's very inappropriate for us as legislators to think that we have uh, the ability to over have, have oversight over those things. That's not our position. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other questions or comments from the representatives online or in attendance? Hearing none, roll call vote, please. Sandra Golden? Yes. Randall Hicks? No. Mark Randolph? No. Patrick Freeman? Yes. Madam Chair, there's a tie vote. In that case, you get to vote. Thomasine Yuhola Osborne? No. Madam Chair, you got two in favor and three against. We have two in favor. Three against NCA 23-037 fails. NCA 23-038, a law of the Muscogee Creek Nation to amend Article 6, Section 2, and Subsection A of the Constitution of the Muscogee Creek Nation by deleting both at-large voting and at-large rep representative and replacing it with eligible registered district voting, resident and absentee, and district representation pertaining to the Muscogee Creek Nation National Council. Sponsor, Representative William Lowe. And this is the substitute, NCA 038 substitute. Madam Chair, make a motion to postpone until the next BF&J meeting. We have a motion to postpone until the next BF&J meeting. Second. We have a second from Representative Randolph. Discussion? Madam Chair, again, this is another piece of legislation that needs more tweaking or more work put into it. From my understanding, there were some issues that weren't addressed. So that's the reason for the postponement. Okay. Any other discussion from the committee? Any discussion from the representatives in attendance or online? Okay, hearing none, roll call vote, please. Randall Hicks? Yes. Mark Randolph? Yes. Patrick Freeman? Yes. Sandra Golden? Yes. Madam Chair, you got four in favor and zero against. We have four in favor, zero against. NCA 23-038 is postponed until the next BF&J meeting. Next item on the agenda, we have referred legislation. NCA 23-033 and NCA 23-040. Ms. Killian, what is the funding source for these two items, please? NCA 23-033 would be interest on permanent fund. NCA 23-040 would be gaming fund. Thank you, Ms. Killian. Thank you, Madam Chair. NCA 23-033, interest on permanent fund. NCA 23-040 is the gaming fund. Do I have a motion to approve the funding source? Madam Chair, I make that motion for NCA 23-033, interest permanent fund, and NCA 23-040 gaming funds to be approved. We have a motion from Representative Hicks to approve the funding sources. Do I have a second? We have a second from Representative Randolph. Any discussion? Roll call vote, please. Randall Hicks? Yes. Mark Randolph? Yes. Patrick Freeman? Yes. Sandra Golden? Yes. Madam Chair, you got four in favor and zero against. We have four in favor, zero against. The funding sources have been approved. Next item on the agenda is other business. MNGE. Madam Chair, make a motion going to executive session. We have a motion from Representative Hicks to go into executive session. Do I have a second? We have a second from Representative Golden. Discussion? Madam Chair, I think all we need is MNGE board, council reps, uh, controller's office, attorney general, our, our attorney's fine. And I believe that's it. 